Welcome to the Player Engage podcast, where we dive into the biggest challenges, technologies, trends, and best practices for creating unforgettable player experiences. Player Engage is brought to you as a collaboration between Keyword Studios and HelpShift. Here is your host, Greg Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Player Engage podcast. Today, we are joined by Lauren Wade, the head of player communications at Calibri Games. I'm excited to be able to talk to Lauren. We last saw each other at the Community Clubhouse event in at Gamescom in Kelowna, and she was a guest speaker or a panelist speaker, though, so it's great. So I'm excited to be joined by you today. Lauren, you want to do a quick introduction of yourself? Sure thing. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren. I am, well, I mean, repeating what Greg said, head of player communications at Calibri Games. We're a Berlin-based mobile game studio, uh, best known for games like Idle Miner Tycoon and Idle Bank Tycoon. What my department is doing is like three separate things. So we are customer support, community management, and localization, hence the name player communications because I figured, well, basically, if it involves talking to players, then it's going through us. Yeah, so that's how they all came together. It's a a really nice joining of three different kind of disciplines that I've worked with before in gaming. I've done a bit of kind of narrative design in Loka. I've I've been a support agent. I've been a game master. I've been a CM. So yeah, mixing all of those together finally into this department is yeah really nice. (laughs) That's fun that you have kind of this vision that you want to what you want to do in gaming and you can kind of combined all these forces to make a role out of it. And I think it's interesting. And about half of our listener group, I'd say, isn't necessarily in the gaming vertical. Can you kind of give us a breakdown? And you just did, but go a little more in depth on what the actual head of player communications does on a day-to-day basis. Lots of meetings, um, but it's essentially, yeah, as I say, anything to do with communicating with the players somehow. So kind of on the CS and CM side, it's very much like problem solving or getting info out to players in advance. So the people on my team will be uh, answering support tickets, which is quite standard across many industries, creating and maintaining FAQs, uh, app store reviews, things like this. But then also out in places like Discord and Reddit, where the community is kind of growing of its own accord. So interacting with players there, getting feedback from them, getting hype, solving problems again, sharing, I don't know, giveaways, social media posts. So yeah, lots of stuff like that. And then, yeah, the localization is kind of at its core translation rather than the localization. So if there's words and we need it in other languages, it will get done by us. But yeah, as anyone who has like a global product market, anything like that will know uh, there's often other things to take into consideration as well for the localization. Um, But you need that in games as well. It isn't just for, I don't know, software or something else. It also definitely works for games. So one of the things that says on on Lauren's LinkedIn profile, if you ever take a look at it, is that she is a language nerd. So we, we do a localization here at Help Shift and Keywords, but I'm curious as a language nerd, how many languages do you know? Oh, I like that you said no, because so many people ask me, how many do you speak? And then I'm always like, oh, it depends on your definition of speak, because yeah, the ones that I've come into contact with, I speak at very different levels. Um, so kind of going from the most fluent downwards, uh, English native, then German, French, probably followed by a mixture of Spanish, Italian, Dutch, Afrikaans, and Russian. So yeah, thing is, with that kind of mix, I can look at basic Portuguese and I can go, okay, I know what that says, but I cannot write it myself. I cannot speak it myself, you know? So yeah, it really depends on what you want to define know or speak as. But yeah, that's just that's just for starters. I'm aiming for 10 because I'm not at 10 languages yet. I'd love to get there. That's like a, a bucket list goal. <laughs> One, a, sto- a quick, quick story about me is when I was younger, I, I wanted to make video games. And I figured, you know what, when I go to college, I'm, I'm going to learn how to do programming. And I went to programming and we did C Sharp or C++. I don't remember what it was. And I was terrible at it. And I was sitting there and I remember going through high school and I was just like, I was terrible at Spanish. I was terrible at all the languages that I needed to learn. I'm just like, I want to learn how to code, but this is just literally another language. And I am terrible at languages. Like I'm a numbers guy. Give me numbers and I can make magic with numbers. But when it came to that, and it just taught me that coding is just another language and I am terrible at languages. So do you know any code? Not really. I've messed around with JSON files and that's about as much as I've ever done just because to me actually like coding language is more like logic than language. And as anyone Mm. who speaks a language will know, languages try to be logical and they're generally not like, you know, English I before E except after C, except for all of these words that don't follow that rule. So there's not a lot of logic. It's just getting used to the rules of it and the exceptions. Whereas with coding, it's very much if this, then this done. So it's almost too logical for me. I need it to be a bit more 
broken and alive <laughs> for it to be a language I speak. Cooking. You know, when you bake, you have to be exact. Yeah. When you cook, you could just use your... Uh... Interesting. Indeed. <laughs> so I want to back up to something you said a little earlier, right? When it comes to player communication, you mentioned a bunch of channels, right? And, you know, channels change over the years, right? Discord's becoming huge. Where, what channel are you seeing most of your player communication happening on? Oh, um, it, it's difficult to say really because we actually have different audiences gravitating towards different platforms. So I would say we've got a very different audience, for example, on different uh, Facebook pages or groups than we have on Discord. It's also just because we as people communicate differently and we have our preferred way of doing it. So Facebook, for example, because it is very like post and comment driven it's almost a bit more static whereas discord um, especially with anything like twitch as well it's so alive it's constant it's so much messaging and for some people it might just be like that's too much it's too much like live stream and it's busy and so you know so where like facebook that's more static is better for them but yeah i would say between yeah facebook because it's been around for so long right i think at this point most people have had something to do with it and discord because as you say it's just starting to really take off it seems so something about calibri games for our listeners that they kind of perfected the idle item style games which maybe that. you Thank can you. give a maybe you can give a quick overview on what an idle game is and then my follow-up question is going to be is are the different channels because there's different demographics playing the different titles even though it's the same style game nice question so yeah um, an idle game is essentially one that kind of plays for you when you've left so you do have to put in a bit of work at the beginning um, in order to automate it so if i take our main title idle minor tycoon for example you have to make sure you've hired managers in all the relevant places and then when you leave the game they will keep everything running for you so that when you come back you've got something to collect and then you can immediately invest what you've collected and start upgrade further um, so yeah that's kind of the appeal of the idle games is that yeah it's not entirely kind of blocked when you're not in the game, but of course you do still need to go in to do stuff. Um, and as for, yeah, different channels, different audiences, I think absolutely the wonderful thing about mobile especially, but also idle games is that you can have such a global audience and such a wide range of ages as well. Just meaning that, yeah, like I said before, people will gravitate towards their preferred um, platforms. Or for example, if you only play it on the commute to work, maybe on your work phone, you're not allowed to have this particular platform. So you'll have a different one. And just that's how you find your little way into whichever community you want um and that's whether you want to be an active participant or not i mean plenty of people lurk on social media right and that's also something that's great about many game communities is that they're not gated you can still go and read the info get the hype get the info get the strategies and everything without necessarily needing to contribute we want you to contribute but yeah it's still a really nice thing that the gaming communities are open to all essentially yeah, and what's fun about the idle games, and I wasn't really a big player of them until Lauren and I first talked, and then she told me about one, and I found Idle Bank Tycoon. And yeah, exactly, yeah. Nice, like you said, you kind of set it up, and it's nice that you don't have to actively always be there, right? You can kind of come at your own own will, collect what you need to, and keep building from there. And I think channels are important, and I appreciate your your insight on that. Uh, when we when we take a look at you, Lauren, right, and we go back. To, maybe to younger Lauren, right? And you're thinking, what do I want to do when I grow up, right? Most people aren't dreaming of running player communications and maybe they are. That's a that's a, a notable one. Some other ones are wild and out there. But well, what did you want to do when you were growing up? It wasn't anything to do with games. Very much until kind of the year that I moved into gaming, I hadn't really thought about the fact that you, you could work in gaming. Like games were a thing that happened. And I guess I just imagined they got created out of nothing but um no i mean tying to like my language type nerdiness i i think at one point i wanted to be an author because i also love playing with the english language and words and i thought that would be cool amusingly at one point i wanted to be an opera singer because then i could sing in different languages and because i enjoy singing and i've got quite a kind of operatic voice when i sing so i was like oh that could do that yes yeah, so it wasn't thinking about being in player communications it really was just after having spent about a decade in retail wanting to move uh, back to Germany where uh, we're now based it's yeah it just happened to be gaming that I ended up coming across with um, kind of support roles and that was the oh games games are a whole like industry because yeah playing them as a kid they're just there they're just this great world you get immersed in and at the time I just honestly didn't think that that was a direction to take so you've always been artistic how, how often are you still singing opera 
uh, opera not so much unless I'm doing it around the house but I do sing in a choir at least so I, okay. I get a little bit of singing in which is good <laughs> it's interesting right uh, your whole artistic background right writing and singing right that works into player communication do you see a lot of crossover from the things that you've learned from both those as well as the localization and how it communicates how it translates well to the player communication Definitely, I'd say it's yeah, gaming as a whole is very creative, um, even kind of in the service departments, just, yeah, ultimately, we're working with a very creative medium. And therefore, yeah, it just gives way to anything else that's creative that blossoms from it, I think. Is there a and this is a weird question, right? Is there a country or group of users that are more appreciative of the uh, uniqueness the creativity of the different ways you could provide this stuff maybe this is a weird question and we should just not go there but i'm just curious if <laughs> if, if that makes sense but we could we could pass on that one there it makes total sense though um honestly there isn't one that i can single out like truly we we are blessed at calibri with the wonderful communities that we have and just across the globe uh, in each region we we just have yeah great sets of players so honestly i couldn't single one of them out which is really really nice so when you start taking a look at kind of uh your community management uh and you're talking about players experiences right you have to think about it on a global level maybe different players in different countries have different experiences here um have you kind of created a structure we like to call them pillars at times like these are our main pillars when it comes to customer support these are the things we must do um th these are core values i guess is another way to look at it mm, um it's a good question. I wouldn't necessarily say it's even just for support because very much for, for me, support and then the community management, like everything together, it has to be one because ultimately the players don't see it as, oh, this support agent told me this, but this community manager told me it, this or whatever. Like we're, we're speaking as the game or the company. And so having that unified approach is kind of a, a core value. Um, so that's across the channels. Like I don't want you to go to one channel and be told one thing and something completely different somewhere else. That's a horrible experience. So that's, yeah, one of my pillars. And I think with that in mind, another one for me really is the the harmony and cohesion between product and then departments like mine just because ultimately when you talk about the player experience so often it is used as being part of customer support but to me as a player my experience is mostly the game mm -hmm. and or the community and or the localization and actually if I get as far as customer support it probably means something went wrong and that's not part of the experience I should be having so seeing all that as a whole with the product lumped in as well for the player experience it's why I think yeah making sure that the product teams are, are, are working as closely as possible with us means that we as a game, we as a company can then present, yeah, a unified approach, which ultimately is the seamless experience you want for the player, right? I think that made sense. Got a bit rambly, it, it, but... <laughs> it does, no, it's great because it, it kind of leads into a next question is how, how do you work with your product team? How do you get them the appropriate information to escalate specific items? How do you, how do you help prioritize what happens next, right? Is it a bug fix? Is it a new game? Is it a feature? Like what's that communication process? Like what tools do you maybe use? Uh, obviously help shift falls somewhere in there. We don't have to go there, but like, is it a Jira shop? Is it something else? Like how, how does all this work? It's mostly for my team just so we're not interfering with other people's processes we're not actually making things in jira directly just so that we don't create extra noise and um, but we yeah we talk a lot in person i'm literally in the office looking at like people in qa as i speak so very much like in person we can have a lot of uh, communication with our product teams but um, essentially over things like slack we just were constantly like as soon as something kicks off we'll be messaging about it and then product will be jumping on it or giving us feedback on it and together we can then coordinate accordingly because um yeah you, it's also a bit of a challenge especially for my team when you're face to face with player problems to give that the appropriate severity for product but also seeing it in a broader scope of things like if you know that product are right now fixing something that's been your number one bug forever and you come in with your number two bug you know they only have so much time that they can dedicate yeah. and so many resources so it's also then having that ability to be able to help them say do we drop the one that we've been working on do we work on this one what do you need and ultimately everybody working towards something for the good of the players it's yeah so lots of active kind of written and spoken communication just to align essentially do you have power in helping shape the roadmap based on what you're hearing from the players absolutely yeah 
absolutely we do it's really nice like that so yeah being able to maybe say hey can we see that sooner hey can we do this here hey is this going to come in um so yeah very much it's a very collaborative thing which is really really awesome at this part of the podcast i didn't warn you about this i like to do kind of like a fire round where i'm just going to shoot some random random questions simple questions maybe uh don't put much thought into it it'll take about a minute or so so good to go okay let's do it if you're going to go to a bar what type of drink are you ordering um, probably a creamy cocktail, like a white Russian or a pina colada. Cool. What is the last game you played? Uh, Hogwarts Legacy. Oh, nice. Uh, what did you have for breakfast today? Cornflakes. Very dull. <laughs> Love it. Can't go wrong with cereal. What's the last book you read? Uh, I'm technically still reading it. I haven't finished it, but I am on book, I think, 40 or 41 in the Discworld series. Um, so wow. I've been reading all of the Discworld books. Wow, how do you have that much time? You wow. I, I started I started reading them right before the pandemic, so it's not oh, like okay. I've been fast. <laughs> Fantastic. And last one, what what is your ideal vacation? Oh, um, some kind of like city trip type thing. I'm the kind of person that really likes to go and see somewhere new and see a lot of it. So I end up needing a holiday from my holiday, if you know what I yeah. mean. So yeah, 100%. That, that kind of thing. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Okay, that's it. Back to the regular regular schedule questions here. Are there any communities that you think that you've been a part of that really helped shape your career? Maybe not just communities where people are like a Discord community, it could be a LinkedIn, but like where have you gotten your information? What helped kind of shape you, Lauren? Oof. Well, I mean, obviously every uh, previous job or person I came into contact with, especially because you keep so many contacts in gaming, it's such a small industry at the end of the day. So just, yeah, kind of shout out to any any player or person I ever interacted with in my time in gaming because somehow you'll have influenced it. But yeah, even just I think right at the, the, the foundation of it is almost my memories of the early communities that I lurked in. So way, way back in the day, I'm a big um, point and click player. And way, way back, I, I just know that we, we'd we go looking for like walkthroughs and stuff because we'd get stuck because you'd have to try and solve these ridiculous puzzles and you wouldn't know how. And then it's almost like I said earlier with these, that the openness of the gaming communities in that I didn't have to create logins for anything. I didn't have to like post a certain amount of times to get the info I wanted. The gaming communities were just like, hey, I figured this out. Here's how you do it. Have fun, um, which I loved. And so just just that wonderful sense of community that I witnessed is kind of almost, yeah, humming away underneath everything that we're doing now, which is super nice. Um, definite big shout out to then, yeah, anyone who might have written a, a walkthrough for any of the old point and clicks I played or anyone who did like walkthroughs for how to find all the Riddler trophies in Arkham City, because yes, I bothered to do that. So thanks to you if you're one of those people. <laughs> the, the community is great and, and it's underrated. I, I've been playing a lot of Starfield recently and nice. I mean, it's a newer game and it's just very complex and you're able to Google or anything and there's a whole thread about how people have created these resources and done all this stuff and I'm just like, good for you for taking the time to do this. You're a hero and you're under underestimated. Exactly, because they don't have to do that. You know, no. you could just be like, I have to figure it out. You can go and figure it out. But no, they want to share. Uh, yep. And it's just, it's lovely. It's just so nice. What's also fun is that I've heard now doing a number of these podcasts so that a number of companies hire these, these individuals that have done all this because they, they see the work that they're doing. And a lot of times the individuals don't want the job. They're like, I just like to do this for fun. Like, Good. It's the love of the game. It's, yep. You should still take a job, but it's for the love of the game. Yep. Not all heroes wear capes, as they say. <laughs> yeah. uh, with your uh, with player communication, right? Uh, and we're in this interesting time where AI is now becoming a great, well, maybe great is not the right word. You could use your own word, <laughs> a way to craft communications, send communications. Um, have you started using any of these tools or any things that worry you or excite you? I mean, the whole topic is just so big. I think we'd be here for about six podcasts minimum talking about it. But essentially, um, I absolutely can see a lot of benefits to it as long as it's properly used. I, I do not believe that AI will 100% replace anyone or anything just because you need that humanity, especially in something like player communications, where there are just so many subtleties. And yes, you can train your AIs over time, but it's, yeah, having that that human eye on it or just that human understanding of your players, um, you know, knowing, okay, this particular player, I know this history, I know how we talk to each other, I know this, I know that it's, yeah, that's just, you can get it almost to a 
per- perfect thing, like 99%, I'm sure, over the years to come. But I, yeah, I think AI needs to be hand in hand with the humans for sure. Yeah. So uh, I guess also when you're looking at that stuff, right, does it work the same in the different languages that you, you do it with, right? I, I, English, I mess around with it. And I'm not even sure if these work in all the different languages that you've uh, you've played around in, and how does that work as well, right? And those are questions I don't know. Exactly. And that's work. even not just um, across languages, but even if you take English, I mean, uh, you know, hearing our respective accents, like what works for like uh, the US English maybe won't work for standard UK English. Maybe you want it to be in a proper like Cockney London accent, whatever you're having written. Maybe you want it in a Northern accent like mine. Like just there are so many subtleties that are just, yeah just maybe not there yet. What about from the product side, right? When you're building games, I'm not sure if you have this visibility into the company, but do you know if the company is exploring any sort of AI trends to to implement into gaming or not quite yet? I couldn't say, to be honest. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll have to wait and see what, what they bring to me. So Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that you kind of had your start in retail before coming into gaming. How did that leap from one to the other happen? Oh, um mainly i'd yeah i had just wanted to move back to germany i was still living in the uk at the time but having uh, done a year abroad for university for the languages i studied i i missed germany and so i was just kind of looking around for jobs in germany and then one popped up that was yeah gaming and customer support and kind of yeah it just spoke to me and worked out so it really was just yeah from retail to co- digital customer service felt like it was logical I'd been doing face to face and so then switching to digital wasn't yeah too unusual it's really not too unusual to see people make these kind of switches I think so from places like retail or hospitality call centers this kind of thing if you've done some form of customer service then it can be applicable to to roles like this I think yeah I agree right and I think it goes the other way too right you can take I always Personally, I like to think gaming helps kind of set the cornerstone of how how customer service works because the freemium model changes how you have to handle groups, large groups of individuals. So I think it's interesting to be able to see it from this and how you can translate it into other verticals. Yeah. I think it's a fun thing to be able to look at. Absolutely. I think even um, it's great to have to deal with the the power of the the passion and the emotions that come through with gaming because it's very different to like if you're selling like pens to people and you're sold out of the particular color pen that they needed and they get annoyed with you like that's that's a very different thing to if like your favorite game that you've logged thousands of hours into like crashes and you lose something or whatever like the the passion that comes from the gaming side is really something quite different to to deal with i think and it's a it's a beautiful thing for that like i've always thought that i kind of I vibe with players a bit more just because, yeah, I, yeah. I'm a gamer as well. And I, I have seen things happen in games that I play just to know how that feels. And it's just different, right? And I completely agree with you. But that's also what kind of scares me about going fully digital is that things can be just turned off, right? You log thousands of hours into Counter-Strike. You log thousands of hours into this game that all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know what? We're going to turn the servers off. And then all of a sudden it's like, my game what happened to all this time like I, it's it's both exciting and scary and kind of what's going to happen when as that medium continues to change on how we interact with with games and, and where those saves and data lives yeah for sure oh but even with physical things in retail i mean yeah if you're selling food items for example one day they you know you might have to change the recipe because of i don't know uh, some yeah change in the supply line or just people don't like the recipe anymore or whatever but then the one person whose favorite recipe it was will be like no my favorite product so i mean not we just need to enjoy all of the things we enjoy while we can it's the it's the whole again cheesy you know seize the day enjoy it today kind of stuff <laughs> why do i keep the, coming out with cheesy stuff this podcast this i is- love it <laughs> with, with all this being said though like do you think about this stuff on your day-to-day basis like when you're doing your job like the passion of the players that you're working with, right? Like, you know, we, we talk about automation and we talk about bots and, and bots do serve a role, right? Like if I want to wait and reset my password, I don't want to have to wait 10 minutes for an agent. I want a bot to just do it instantly. But at the same time, I don't want my player that's been spending money and have to have this robotic experience. Like, how does this balance work? And I, you may not even be able to answer, right? Like, Yeah, it's... um. I don't think that there's a perfect formula for it or if there is it will be a different formula for every game every company Um, so 
yeah, exactly. It's balancing speed, which is where your automations and stuff absolutely can be faster than your humans. And that's ultimately really important. Like whatever problem I've had, I want it fixed so I can get back to gaming. But at the same time, you want to have that human element to it. And you can't really know in advance, uh, not in every case at least, what your player wants or needs. Because some people will favor speed over anything else. Some people will absolutely want the human interaction. Some days people have a different feeling towards it anyway. So it's just a case of trying it out and seeing where your sweet point in the middle is and just knowing that, yeah, sometimes people might have to wait for a human when they could have gone through a bot or sometimes they'll go through a bot and they'll be annoyed about it because, they, yeah, it, it really is just finding where that, that point in the middle kind of is, I think. Is it and is it your role or is it a different role of the company that takes a look at things like customer satisfaction and decides to build out new automations or change up workflows? Like who whose role is that and how often is it looked at? Yeah, that's our department. So we yeah, we look at CSAT like all of the time. Um CSAT's always an interesting one because I often find you can't take it just as a cold, hard number. It's absolutely kind of a good pulse check, but you so often have to dig a bit deeper in to understand it because, of course, so often with that passion behind what players are doing, if they've had a bad experience in the game, no matter how well you've helped them, they might rate the problem that they had or the feature you didn't put in or something like that. Or they might just be playing around with the fun bot and, oh, look, the one star looked cute or something. So digging a bit deeper to actually understand what the issues are that's always important with the csat but it's absolutely part of it because you know they don't have to leave you a csat and if they've taken the time to do it then yeah seeing what they've said about it is definitely important yeah we released an update at help shift a couple maybe a year ago or so where each star rating right you can start to dig yeah. into it like why yeah. and it makes sense because you know what you want that perfect five csat everyone does right it's impossible but when someone comes and says hey i want my account unbanned because I was banned because I did terrible things in the game and Lauren comes to me and says no Greg you're still banned you, you did terrible things in there like I'm not gonna give you a five star like oh thanks for telling me I'm still banned like uh, so we gotta understand why why did Greg give it one star and then you can see that and you can be like oh all right well yeah. it is what it is right like it's a ban request like certain types of issues are going to get bad CSET and that's just yeah. the exactly. story of the game Exactly. But you do have to check because especially thinking of kind of the, the word, the language, the localization side of things is that sometimes if you see this player said, oh, you know, I found the tone a bit rude or something, if you then read it back through, of course, um, I think I was actually speaking about this with someone at the community clubhouse, how it's not the person doing the writing that sets the tone, it's the person reading it. So the support agent maybe wrote something in a way that they thought was just nice and clear for the player, but actually depending on your, I don't know, cultural interpretation of a certain phrase or something, or just how it was put in the whole thing. Yeah, the player might have read it in a more negative way than it was intended. And then that turns into feedback for phrasing and stuff, which will then do in how like there's, yeah, there's so much to it. <laughs> I, I love that the, the tone is set by the reader, right? Because so many times you get a text message and you're like, why is this person so mad at me? And it's just like, it's just <laughs> how I'm reading the text message. You're actually just asking how I'm doing today. It's Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. And that's also why it, right down to the little things um, in the messages that we write, like the amount of exclamation marks you use, like exclamation marks when used properly can be yeah, for, for hype or for stress or something. But if you've got too many of them, then it undermines it or it looks like you're shouting at somebody and just, yeah, it's it's really, yeah, I think a, a support message or a, you know, public post or just whatever, much like with a translation, it's never finished. There's always another way you could have done it. And so, yeah, learning from, from them is always super interesting. And that's the language nerd again, I think. <laughs> well, you know, I, I feel like there's these questions that I, I don't know if we want to dig into, but when it comes to your, the support agents, right, do they have the freedom to respond just with whatever text are you do you do you recommend them using text templates like how much is this gated versus it's the creative freedom I and mean, it sounds weird talking in that tone but it's uh, no there's absolutely freedom um for me the text templates are more like time savers because we do yeah. get a lot of very similar messages right we have a lot of players who will ask the same things and so it's just easier to have certain walkthroughs in a certain manner that they can just use but no we absolutely have full kind of creative freedom to reply to people. So I, I love seeing that when people have 
tailored their responses to a particularly invested player who's I don't know had a really great idea maybe even sent us like artwork or something just who knows just it's it's so much nicer to see them have an actual human to human conversation so no fully fully approved awesome what tools do you use on a daily basis that help you keep your life organized and move it forward I like that you assume my life is organized. No, it's like, yes, uh, I, I like yeah, to try and be as organized as possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, let me think. We Everybody's kind of got a different way of working, so I've tried to come up with kind of unified things that everyone can use. But, yeah, some people on my team seem to like to have every single possible tab open at once and they know where everything is and that's how they know what's going on. I can't work like that at all, so I'm more like I've got little like tab groups that I can open up if I'm doing certain things. We have um, priorities that we have to follow and we've got those in I don't know maybe it's in a Google sheet from before just because that's very collaborative I'm a prolific user of my slack bot reminders just because <laughs> that's so much easier than moving it into something else if somebody pings me hey do this I set my reminders so yeah each to his own but I try to be as organized as possible with uh, with these few simple tools <laughs> There you go. Yeah, you know, I haven't tried Slack bot reminders. I, I change my tool every few days because I, I hate one tool after a few days. It's just like I maybe just can't work with tools. I just stay disorganized. But it's always curious to kind of see how people are, are accomplishing their day to day work. It's the, whatever works. I mean, I'm actually I'm much more of a kind of pen and paper person. I always do have a, a notebook by my side, and I, I have multicolored pens and stuff, and I cross them off when I'm done with it and things like that. But also because our work is so digital, I often feel bad for my physical pen and paper because most of the time whatever i've physically written down probably has to be on my laptop at some point so i should probably save my own time by just writing it <laughs> somewhere yeah, but right. oh it's that pen and paper thing is just still too nice for me it's just it's easier to remember i think when you're physically writing i think it just ingrains it in your brain as well it's yeah i guess this is why teachers would make us do lines when we were kids right because it, it supposedly ingrains it into your head <laughs> hopefully Next five years, gaming is going to change because gaming changes all the time. Yes. Do you have any thoughts or predictions on where kind of the players experience or how it's going to change or how the players are even just going to interact with the games over the next five years? I'm never very good at predictions, especially just because I'm now so used to being in quite a service driven department that I'm like, I go with the flow. We'll just make it work with whatever's coming. But um, I mean, we've mentioned the automations, the AI that can only continue, right? I think actually rather than what we will see, I'll just say what I would hope to see, which is back to one of those pillars that I mentioned, this harmony and close work with product teams, just because ultimately, you know, too many cooks can spoil the broth. So I totally get that not everybody can be involved in everything at every step of a project, but very much, yeah, as the player experience grows, just making sure that, yeah, we have the the product and the support services as close together as possible. It's it's going to be the way that you make everything great for the players. And yeah, I like that again. saying. Too many cooks can spoil the broth. And I, I like the the way you're going because I think even here we struggle at times getting the feedback from customer to product. Right, it kind of becomes this messy flow and. We offer, right, we have a Jira plugin with HelpShift that some companies utilize, right? And and that's fine. That's a good way to do it. But I'm always just curious. And that's why I asked you earlier, like, how do you get your feedback to the product team, right? Is it weekly stand-ups? Is it monthly stand-ups? Is it just Slack messages? Because mm -hmm. there's certain companies I've worked with over time where it's just kind of like, oh, I'm going to tell something to product. And it's like a, in one ear, out the other ear. It's just like, I know this isn't sticking in. And then how do you take numbers like, hey, Lauren's spent $10,000 in, in the game last month. We probably want to take that bug that she's having and make it priority. Like, how do you get the product team to listen? And, and I think it's a great way to think about it. And over the next five years, how is that communication? How do, how do you make that work? Exactly, because yeah, it has to be in both directions as well. Like I, I really do see it as a team effort. It shouldn't just be me constantly shouting at the product team being like, why aren't you listening to me doing what I tell you to? Because ultimately, they're trying to keep the product running and trying to make sure that in the long run, in the bigger picture that we often don't see that everything is going the way that it should. So it's also then if the product team are like, we cannot prioritize this thing that you're telling us about. Here are the reasons. Here's when you can expect it. It's also good for my team just so that they can adjust how they speak to the players perhaps or just so that they know that we're not being ignored which i think is possibly what other people perhaps in other companies that you've spoken to have possibly felt is that they just don't hear the 
we get that this is a thing and we will work on it at some point. But um, so yeah, it's the two way two way communication, I think, which is super important because, yeah, just because it comes up as an issue today doesn't mean you should immediately jump on it. And also quite a lot of the time, especially with ideas, I have luckily found players so often will suggest things that we already have like ideas for or we've already got planned. It's just because we plan in advance. We just haven't got there yet. So it's actually kind of, yeah, just remembering that we're not just working day to day or week to week. There is a, a bigger plan, which is, yeah, where the communication is very important. It's always fun when a new game comes out and everyone's like, what were they thinking? Why didn't they do this? Like, I'm sure the company knows that that's an issue and they wanted to do that. But there's a lot of other things that need to happen to, in order to make this happen, right? It's a, a game, a, a product is a living, breathing tool right and and you can't just make a change like this you gotta gotta make sure you test it out it's working everything sings in harmony for lack of better words absolutely yes for all the linguists out there that want to become player communications reps uh what advice would you give them on how you make that transition what's important What, what what are the things you want to pay attention to so i think it's ever so slightly different depending on which of the disciplines uh, I handle you'd go for so the the support side um, is definitely all the stuff we've we've had before right things like your your retail your hospitality call centers anything like that like hands-on customer service that will serve you in any job though in any discipline this is also something that I live by which is I think everybody needs to do at least a year in some form of customer service it will make them better people um, so yeah everybody go and do some form of customer service that will set you up well um I would say yeah. angry or not better but both maybe both <laughs> no it absolutely makes you better i think i'm a better customer because i have been working on the other side of the counter you know so that's um very good for the the support stuff for social media community management anything like that if you're involved already in communities yourself then that's already something especially if you're i don't know running something you know, on the side, um, just for a game or just any product or thing that you like, if you're doing anything with that, it's going to help using social media helps. I mean, technically, we can't all be like experts on the platforms. But generally, if you're a daily user of it, you'll have an idea, which is already helpful. And as for uh, localization stuff, for sure, it's, um, yeah, just trying to be as correct and flexible as possible like obviously yeah um attention to detail and quality in the language is something that's across all departments i think um this is just because i am a language nerd and so yeah if i've played super kind of fresh new games that are very small and they're not doing much with it but the the loca is like just completely nonsensical and bad quality it it affects my enjoyment of the game and i find the same for then the player's experience so yeah if you're wanting to go into the localization side of it community cm anything like this um yeah having that languagey sense is going to be that makes no sense at all the languagey sense but yeah um yeah (laughs) that's gonna make not that much sense either but (laughs) with your different roles between community management support communication like what part's your favorite that's difficult it'll depend on the day I your think kid, which yeah is that's favorite. the thing if 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 I'm helping out with something on the localization side and it's super juicy and it's like a new I don't know it's a new character name and we get to do something really creative with it I'll love kind of brainstorming on what we can do with it and you know how clever we can get with it and learning what the alternative like versions are so that's always super juicy but then on other days if I don't know we've just released a feature and the community are absolutely loving it then I love kind of seeing what's going on on social media with everybody chatting about it on support side just you know anyone who works in support always loves that kind of checkbox logic of getting stuff done and so yeah just uh i can't pick one it really is it's the it's this perfect blend of the three that i i really do i'm very blessed to be able to do that one of my last questions here is you know one of the things that i've always struggled with is kind of feeling like you hit that glass ceiling or that ceiling of kind of what what do i do now for someone that's in your role what what's the next logical step for us it may not be what you want right but what's the next logical step of where you go from where you are oh great question I kind of feel like anything to do with communications is always good. So, I mean, yeah, whether it would be, um, I don't know, 
PR type stuff. Who knows? That could probably be another string to the bow because then it isn't just players. It's then like peer communication, I suppose, is possibly something that could work. I do know plenty of other people in kind of similarish roles where they actually do all communications as part of their role, right? So that's technically something other people are doing that I'm not. So that could be a logical one. But why not throw a curveball in there? I'm sure there'd be something else that could come up that might just fit how my department works. And then we'll we'll add it to our kind of uh, skill set, I guess. Um, open yeah. for anything, very flexible. <laughs> there you go, keep an open mind, right? There's always fun things that are even being created to this day. If there's, you know, with these new channels coming out, new mediums coming up, how to communicate, right? There's new roles that can be created, especially with AI out there, right? Exactly, exactly. Or maybe, you know, maybe we end up doing a game where they decide they want to soundtrack with, with some opera singing on it, and I'll be like, ah, my time has come. Nailed it. <laughs> and then, right. sure, and which, then I'll do that. Which language? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um. Lastly, for our, our fans out there that, that want to play Calibri games, any, any news, any, any updates you could provide anyone? No specifics, but I mean, um, depending on when you're listening to this, uh, the the big kind of end of year seasons are about to kick off. We're going to go through Halloween right the way to the new year with everything in between. And that's always an exciting time with fun stuff that will happen uh, in the games. So, yeah, just... Um, yeah, that big end of year roller coaster will be the thing to look out for. So my my last question I have for you, Lauren, and I appreciate you being on here today is what language are you going to learn next? Oh, great question. I was actually thinking um, I'd love to learn sign language because, oh, um, yeah, it, it's also a very kind of useful, practical one. But that then it also fascinates me because there's going to be so many different versions of it. I believe American Sign Language is different to British Sign Language is probably different to German Sign Language. So that will open a whole wonderful, really? interesting rabbit hole where it's not just words, it's kind of gestures as well. And I think that's, yeah, that's extremely fascinating. Crazy. I never really thought about that, but I guess that makes sense since our languages are different. So mm -hmm. crazy. Awesome. Well, Lauren, I appreciate you coming, taking the time today. This was a few months in the making. It was cheesy. It was informative. It was uh -oh. fun. So thank you again, Lauren, for coming on. We'll have all of Lauren's as well as Calibri Games information on their Player Engage website. We'll post it online. Uh, I appreciate you again coming on today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. See you soon. Bye.